I think James Hadley is an non anomaly. He's a man with energy, wealth, power, position, a conscience, somebody who is aware of his fellow man in a way that a lot of people aren't. Somebody who actually can say, I don't like that and I'm going to do something about it. He was a man who was apparently very much in control and when most of us throughout much of our lives are completely out of control, we always admire people who tend to look as if they're in complete control of their lives. And that's something that James Hadley did. Well, I think it was a bit glamorous, wasn't it? I mean, Gerald was very, very smooth. Um, and I think that women of a certain, women of a certain age and above really went for him. The life of Mr. Hadley, a wealthy landowner, with absolutely no problems in life, everything facing forward, money that he had inherited, great estate, a few thousand acres in the loveliest part of England, Yorkshire, and not too many problems. He has farms that he lets out, uh, rides to hunt, um, and, and he's interested in the arts, and he's, he is a upper-class, um, attractive guy. There's something about the lonely man on the hill who has everything in the world except what he wants. And I remember us gathering to watch it. And then I don't remember what happened. And I don't remember what sort of reaction it got at all, actually. I have not the faintest notion whether it was even noticed. The reaction to the, uh, the audience and the press to Gazette was mixed. It was, in most cases, praiseworthy. When I was finishing Gazette, I had a job to go to. I was um, going off to Ireland to be in a film. So my memories of anything sort of cosy and nice happening were really um, covered by the fact that I was going to start a new job and a new film. I was just happy for, to do it and go home. And, and then to my amazement, and this I, this I was stunned by, I got a phone call saying, this is about six months later, we've had a long think about this and we've decided not to go ahead with, with Gazette, but we would like to go ahead with you. About a rumoured bid by the powerful Shawcliffe Group for a Yorkshire weekly newspaper, the Westdale Gazette, founded in 1892 by Mr William Hadley, a Westdale wool merchant and controlled by his great-grandson, Mr. James Hadley, a former civil servant and prominent Yorkshire landowner. The spin-off to Hadley from Gazette occurred from one of those meetings that often happened in Yorkshire television. You went into the canteen, you sat down at a table, and you found all sorts of different people there, one of which happened to be your director of productions, who said, what have we learnt about Gazette? Um, can we use it in any way? Can we, is there anything we can do for another series? Or uh, I can't do another series, or is it, would it be a good idea to do another series? Because I, it, I think you're going to have difficulty selling it. And then I said to him, well, the thing that really sticks in my mind is that you know, you've got a, a good central character in your character, the newspaper proprietor, which is uh, Hadley, which is played by Gerald Harper. It sounded interesting 
But I said, what are we going to do? What's he going to do? You've got to tell me. So there was some pause then. Mr Hadley, is there any particular reason for retaining 25% of the West Hill Gazette? Yes, yes, there is. My great-grandfather founded the paper. My father and grandfather spent a great deal of time building it up. Then why agree to this takeover by the Shawcliffe Group? To give my paper the advantage of a massive financial organisation behind it. The difference between Hadley and Gazette is that Gazette was a series about a newspaper, a local newspaper, with a proprietor, uh, an editor and editorial staff, whereas Gazette, uh, whereas Hadley was the uh, programme which majored in on the central character of James Hadley, who happened to be the proprietor of a, a local newspaper, but at the same time he was an industrious, he was a, a landowner, and he has, was a man with a huge conscience. I hope it'll continue as it always has in the traditional role of the mouthpiece of the Westdale area. Yes, of course. Well, now you have relinquished control, Mr Hadley. Uh, are you thinking of going to politics? Good heavens, no. And then I had a lunch. I had a wonderful lunch, which is always a mistake. I had a wonderful lunch with Peter Wills, who can be uh, as winning as any human being I've ever known, if he wanted to be. And he was enthusiastic, and he had a very clear idea of what he wanted. And I thought, well, if this man's going to do it, I'll go with it. Was it a reporter? From the Westdale Gazette, sir. <laughs> oh, well, you'd, uh, you'd better ask him in, hadn't you? I'm sorry to barge in like this, but could I talk to you for a minute? Gillian Ray we kept for Hannity's because she was a character that had sparked off with Gerald Harper in a kind of junior way, and it was nice to see the sort of evolution of a character from being a shy reporter, well, perhaps not so shy a reporter, but certainly somebody who was a junior reporter, and to become established as somebody uh, uh, who had equal stance with with uh, James Hadley, basically, and eventually to, to be of the love int interest. Gillian Ray went, came into the first series of Hadley, and the given facts were that uh, I was to marry Gillian Ray. But when you go and work Stop for Shortly... Alfred Saunacy was A, the script editor, and B, wrote many of the episodes. And, um, I mean, he, he was a friend of everybody in the royal family. And, I mean, he, he lived in the world of Hadley. Freddie Shaughnessy's idea was that Gillian Ray should actually get married to James Hadley. Um, I said that, you, and wanted to do it in the first episode, I said, you are eroding the dramatic mileage like nobody's business. You've got to spin this out. I want you to marry me. You see, I've never married before because, quite frankly, I've never had the good fortune to meet a girl that I could face spending the rest of my life with. And I remember saying to them, I think this is a mistake because we'd by now argued about it a lot and it seemed to me that the image was the man on the hill who's enormously rich, which we'd all like to be. He's got a lovely house, which we'd all like to have. And a lot of women like him very much, but never the one he wants. And I always thought that he should be a loner and alone. It's just that I enjoy life so much, I can't go on enjoying it by myself. And you're the only girl I've ever met that I could face sharing it with. We'd have fun, children, when you're ready. Well, that's about all. It was quite a mouthful, wasn't it? James, I had no idea. So now I started to go into battle a, a bit about it, not because of Gillian Ray, it was absolutely wonderful, but the idea that if he got married, I, I, th I always thought that that's, it's the lonely man on the hill that is appealing. I heard 
during the course of my filming, I think, that, that uh, Hadley was being set up because they rang me and asked me if I'd be in one of the episodes. Morning. Oof. How's the world? Spinning, or it could just be my head. Well, I'll give you my news very quietly and I'll... Uh, Silently steal away. Oh, that would be most considerate. It didn't worry me that Gerald and Gillian and everybody was going on to do a brand new series. I mean, I had my own life. I had my own excitements happening. I I'd, I'd newly married and uh, doing my films and what have you. I mean, work was being offered to me uh, of a totally different nature, and I was very happy about it. We took the characters that we thought would be most useful to us in Hadley. It was a different direction to go. It was centred on, on the character of James Hadley. I remember doing my one episode of Hadley. I remember coming in and of course they were all friends, you see. All the, all the people in the studio, all the technical people, the cameramen, the technicians, the makeup, the wardrobe department. They were all, um, all people I've worked with, all people I have relationships with and of course still Part of the cast were old friends as well. Look, you deliberately used the Gazette to further your own ends. You didn't want the news of this deal out until you'd finished your job. How's Miss Winkle? <clears throat> you made a fool out of me and everybody in Westdale. Heads. Sorry. And uh, we didn't make too much use of the characters in, in, in the Gazette because they were really sort of s sidelined by Hadley's direction, basically. Um, the, the, it was a new series. It was it was about looking at what was happening in the area and around and putting things right, basically. I, I just felt there was perhaps a little bit more money being spent on Hadley than was ever spent on Gazette, but no jealousies or anything like that. Oh, damn it, last. Sorry. <laughs> James, <laughs> what on earth made you play like that? Because I wasn't concentrating. Bad luck, James. Uh, that's the rubber. Well, what's the matter with you? Nothing. I have to admit, you weren't very talkative at dinner, was he? No, he wasn't. You sat there like a constipated oyster. Had his aunt portrayed by Ambrosine Pil Philpott. She was an aristocratic lady in the series, as she was written, but she was a delight to work with as a person. James has been a bachelor far too long. Spoilt, that's what he is. He needs to be broken in. All men do, really. Untrained animals, most of them. Ambrosine Philpotts. Well, the best thing, or one of the best things, Peter Wills ever did was to invent the character of my aunt. I think it was, she was a recommendation of Peter Wills, basically, who said, I know exactly the person for that, and he was right. We're bubbling over with jollity. Except you. Sorry, I'll try and cheer up. So I should hope. It's very old man to ask us all to dinner and then sit around like an undertaker. And uh, I think she was an enormous contributor to whatever success it had. She was an utter delight to work with. She was, she was <laughs> funny. And um, she and Peter Wills had a battle about the number of hats that she would wear. And Robert Morley used to send a telegram saying, time you had a new hat. So a lot of money went on her hats almost as much as went on my suits. And Peter Wills went to Huntsman, who was probably the number one uh, tailor in Savile Row. And he sent me to Kilgore French and Stanbury, which was definitely number two in Savile Row, if not equal number one. And uh, for the first time in my life, I went to a Savile Row tailor, and it was, it was a wonderful, it is a wonderful experience, because you go in and um, spend an hour and a half looking at endless amounts of cloth, and then you're taken down a corridor to the fitting room, where there's one man measures you up for the trousers, there's one man measures you up for the waistcoat, there's one man who measures you up for the coat, and they never, ever finish a sentence. And they talk to each, call each other Mr. Now, Mr. Plum, don't you think there's a little, yes, I do, and shouldn't we just do a, a yes, I think that's exactly what we should do. I think the cuff isn't quite, no, I quite agree, Mr. Plum, I think we should just shorten it a bit, and we could take the waist, yes, that's right, Shall we take the waist, and then you go away, and you come back and go through this fitting again. And, um, and the first suit I ever had cost a thousand pounds, and by the time 
I finished doing Hadley about eight years later, they were costing three and a half thousand pounds. And in the boardroom, there was a sort of furious row when they looked at these bills. They said, what the hell is Harper having suits made at three thousand pounds a time? And one of the members of the board said, well, I go to Geeves and I get them off the peg and they cost about a tenth of that. And Peter Wills looked at him with a gimlet eye and said, yes, and it looks like it. And uh, so he insisted that all the time, I've still got one of those suits now. I was reading the Times one day at breakfast and, and there was an article about Kilgore French of Stanbury. And there was a photograph. And the minute I saw the photograph, I dropped the paper, I went straight to the phone, I rang up the Times, and I said, I must have that photograph. And they kindly sent it to me. And the reason was, it's the best billing I'll ever have in my life, because it was a photograph of the corridor to the fitting rooms. And there were these big brown envelopes with the names stenciled on them. And the three that you could see, it went Her Majesty the Queen, the Lord Astor, Gerald Harper. <laughs> well, I'll never do better than that. Are you quite sure about that suit? Aren't you? Well, it depends, I'd say, on the venue. Yes, well, I think anything more subtle might be a distraction. That's... Yes, sir. After about five episodes of Hadley, I met Donald Bavistock, who was the head of the programme, in the bar. And Donald Bavistock said to me, hello, hello, Gerald, he said. Well, he said, I've just seen the first five episodes. He said, they're not going to like it, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh. I said, well, he said, I don't think they're going to like him. And I said, well, I can't, I don't know what to do about that, I said. I can't undo my shirt and growl a bit and try and be charming. I said, again, I tried not to be too nice. I've tried to play against being charming, for want of a better word, and I've tried to be rather waspish and sharp, uh, only to stop it being too marshmallow. Well, he said, I don't think they're going to like it. So I thought, oh, well, all right. And um, sold it on and made the next six episodes. And sure enough, Donald Bavistock, showing enormous faith in the programme, put it out at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, which is not time to get great viewers, and wrote to me and said, we've decided not to do any more. So he tore up the options which they'd taken up and tore up the contract. <laughs> So, uh, much to my surprise, I think because it went out at 11 o'clock at night when people expected absolute rubbish and suddenly those who happened to stay out and see it were um, rather agreeably surprised that it wasn't all that bad. We had front page of the TV Times. And the TV Times held a competition. And. Uh, and they said, who's your favourite person on television? And, and, and I came number one of the top ten. Even Donald Bavistock, who, who's the, by then chairman of the um, networking committee, when I saw him on the station at Euston when we were going around, said, I've sold your programme and we've got prime time for it, Boyo, he said. And I said, of course you did. So I got a letter from Donald Bavistock saying, I think I've made a slight mistake. And um, we've had a lot of compliments about this programme. And would you consider doing some more? And I said, well, yes, I would consider doing some more. But of course, we'll just have to think, rethink one or two things. And uh, I threw the knives and forks and spoons about a bit. And I wrote myself a wonderful contract. It was the one time in my life I'd be able to write a contract. I think most people were pleased to do a second series. Uh, it was different because Freddie Shaughnessy was no longer with us, so we had another script editor. That was something of a of a, a difficulty, basically, and we had to change tack in the middle of that one um, because we ran out of time. Basically, we had a script editor who was not 
very experienced in script editing for television and um, didn't actually deliver the goods to us and so we had to make a plan B and change and we had various additional scripts that were written by different people and picked up production and met the air date but that was quite close. If I married you now, I'd be known for the rest of my life as the girl reporter on a local rag who married the squire. <laughs> well, I want to be somebody in my own right first. Well, otherwise, I'm so vulnerable. And you think that Fleet Street is going to save you from the Mrs. Davies of this world, do you? Gillian Ray's character was used in the first series as a kind of love interest, but... Um, there were obvious progressions in people's um, relationships and it, it just was seen that it would be better for her for it not to work and to, for him to go and to leave him free basically to go off in a different direction. I think quite simply I, either you get married but then they decided not to do that in which case her story is ended. And so they, did they then, I think the next lady who hove over the horizon was Jane Merrow. Charlotte. And I was brought in as uh, a love interest for Hadley. Uh, Mr Hadley, I'd like you to meet my new associate from London, Mrs Hepton. Hello again, Mr Hadley. We cast uh, Jane Merrow, who played Anne Hepton, in the second series, in the normal way, we just looked to the normal leading ladies that were about and who were available and uh, went through them and talked to the casting department of Yorkshire Television, which by now is in full flight. I, I remember that um, she was a rather fraught um, mother uh, of a young child um, who is sort of run away from her husband, if you will. They were, she hadn't really run away, but they, they'd sort of separated because he was... A uh, pretty hopeless, rather wild character. What the hell do you want? Shh. Not in front of the children. She was a, a single mum, uh, not typical of the 70s, but they occurred, they happened, they always have happened, and they were happening in the 70s. And this is one of the things we try to bring out in the series and say, this is perhaps a social issue of the time, let's look at this. And in fact, my mother was a single parent. Um, my parents were divorced in an age when it was really quite very difficult. And I think she went through very similar things. She was the sole support of the family. And my grandmother was my, my sort of looked after me. And I, I was a small child being looked after, very spoiled, of course. And um, I think my mother felt the burden of that. Anne Hepton's estranged husband, which was played by Michael Billington, turned up later on and caused havoc uh, and uh, was an interesting sort of um, situation for James Hadley to deal with. Who do you think you are? Flaming God Almighty. What do you care for Charlotte? I care for Charlotte. All right. I tell you what. We'll go out there and we'll ask her. We'll see who she wants to take her own, be it her daddy or the flaming squire. We'll consult the oracle. We'll soon see. Come on. For the last time, you're going to let me know. Not on your flipping nanny. Oh, Lord. And that's the, you see, beware the pram in the hall. That's, I, I seem to remember saying that and saying, surely we don't want a pram in the hall. It's not what this series is about. I remember we were in one of our rehearsal rooms in London and in walked Michael, and he was young and he was good looking and he was a little bit brash, but that was the character he was playing as well. But he was an awfully nice man. And he was a very good actor. And, um, you know, that's important, especially when you're playing what I call um, sparky scenes. We, we had a connection a really good connection. I've come home. You've done nothing of the kind. This is my home, mine and Charlotte's. I bought it and I worked to... My God, you've got a nerve. What makes you think I can even stand the sight of you? Don't you think we owe it to Charlotte? Oh, you owe us plenty. 
and you can pay it by keeping out of our lives. I had uh, some of the best scenes I had in the whole show with Michael, I think. I mean, those terrible husband and wife arguments are often quite scintillating. Uh, you know, when I say scintillating, they're um, <laughs> stimulating. There's only one place I ever want to see you again. That's in the divorce court. What does Charlotte say? Charlotte's a child. Well, let's call her in and ask her, shall we? My God, you're cheap. You play on her feelings. Well, her father, why not? You have about as much right to be a father as... You should have thought of that before, darling. And one of our scripts uh, towards the end of the second series was uh, Nicola Penn, and that title character was played by Hannah Gordon, and she came in to kind of... Um, a rather distraught, I believe, or upset um, Hadley at the time. I think things were not going too well. Excuse me, Lord Bascom? Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Orwin, World American. I wonder if I... James. And I think she came in sort of to replace me as Gerald's love interest. Hannah Gordon was, uh, I mean, I thought a wonderful actress. And I, I do remember finding her very easy to act with. After all, we never did actually have an affair, did we? No, we didn't. Perhaps if... Yes. You know, at first I thought it was for my sake. Then after you'd gone for your sake. And then for my sake again. Well, that sounds nice, whichever way you look at it. It also has the merit of being true. Actually, H Hannah's an unlikely sort of uh, messer of relationship. She's such a nice person. And her character was always so uh, warm and loving. You can't imagine Hannah e ever sort of coming in and, and throwing a, a spanner in anybody's works. Oh, they told me you were being interviewed. Yes. And let me introduce you to a friend of mine, Sarah Orwin. Sarah, this is Anne Hepton. How do you do? I think we try to make Hadley reflective of real life, basically. I think every programme, whatever you do, comedy, um, serious drama, it's got to have social relevance. And the social relevance of life is that thing, you have a graph of ups and downs, basically, and you can't, everything can't always end on an upbeat, so but you have to leave people with hope for the next series if you go on to that. I remember, I think the, Jane Merrow came in as a romantic attachment, but the decision eventually was not to marry her because children, prams in the hall. It doesn't go with the idea that Alfred Shaughnessy had of this gentleman really all the lady loves except the one he wants. I think Jane Barrow sort of disappeared out of his life and he was left lonely again and everybody was meant to go, ah. Dearest James, I've thought about this for most of the night and now it's nearly four o'clock and I've made up my mind. I'm going to London first thing in the morning. I'll see Hornby. I'll take the Bristol job. This means leaving Westdale and leaving you. Really, James, I don't want to know any details about Sarah. It's enough that she exists. It was it was sort of sold to me. It was a one one off. I mean, you never know, and the and and indeed the producers don't know. If you suddenly catch on as a character, so completely, um, they they will keep you on because they, what's the point of getting rid of you? But on the other hand, this character was never going to really be like that. And also, um, because they needed to keep James Hadley footloose and fancy free and available for other women, it wouldn't have been very good to have one woman sort of hovering in the background because it really wouldn't have been that believable. My job at Yorkshire Television was to produce drama series. I produced Gazette, I produced Hadley, and I was then asked to look at and take over and produce Parkins Patch. And then Terence Williams, a nice man, a delightful man, left. And I had to move on. And that is a way in all television programming that it works. You, you, you start it, you move on, and another producer will normally take it over and inject something else into it. <laughs>
casting, well, a suggestion that Jackie Stoller should produce it. I became producer of Hadley uh, because at that time I was working for Yorkshire Television as um, a casting director and prior to that I'd been um, a production assistant. And the head of drama, Peter Wills, called me in and said that he wanted to turn me into head of, head of casting and I heard this voice say, no, I'm far too young to be head of casting. Uh, I'd like to be a producer. And he, he said, oh, that's very interesting. He said, um, I'm going away for four months, but I, for four weeks, and I think, um, yes, I think that's a very good idea, but don't say anything to anybody. So he left me high and dry, came back and said he'd spoken to the controller of um, a controller of programmes, Donald Baverstock, and they thought it was a very good idea, but would I please come up within 48 hours with a 13-part storyline? And the most important thing was they wanted Hadley to be married which was a bit frightening. The whole thing was terrifying, to be truthful, to do it in that time. I think it's very healthy to change producers on, on, on uh, programmes. I, I've done it before and since. Did it with the BBC when I did uh, Juliet Bravo and uh, moved on from there to do uh, Chinese Detective whilst having another producer take over from that. Yeah, I think it is a good thing. It injects something into it. There's a new angle. It's a freshness, you know. You can, uh, if you get the right people, as long as they don't take it apart and destroy it. The next big hurdle was to meet Gerald Harper, who played Hadley. Because, of course, if he had said, no, I don't want this person, that would have been the end of me. I'd been down, I was doing a play at the Haymarket Theatre, and I'd been down to a club called the Buxton Club, which is a very well-known, quiet, actors' drinking club. It shows you how long ago it was that Ronnie Corbett was working behind the bar. And I met Jackie Stoller. Black, sparkling eyes, black hair, black silk dress. And I thought, this, this girl is above my weight, I thought. She's a pretty startling creature. And then I heard she was going to produce Hadley. We are talking about early 70s, so um, women producers weren't common at all at that stage, particularly women that they'd known within the organisation as a production assistant and a, ca a casting director. A friend of mine said, you know she's never produced anything in her life before. Do you think it's wise that she should make her mistakes on your watch? Shouldn't you insist on an experienced producer? And I said, no, no, no. A, I've met her, and B, I've had Verity Lambert as a lady producer at the very beginning of her career, and she turned out a winner. And so I have a feeling that Jackie Sol is going to turn out a winner too. And I was right. I just thought that he, is, he was very, very charming. I was nervous, obviously, but I, I thought he was wonderful. I thought he was very, very charming and gracious and intelligent and... And I thought a good person to work with, and it turned out that to be so. I decided to change the titles and, and, and make it much more open, and um, with, with the photography from, from, um, from Hadley Hall, as it were, um, and, and to use that and to open it up and to, and to get Tony Hatch to write the music, because he was kind of flavour of the month and I liked his stuff. I know that the only thing I was interested in was getting my own horse in the um, in in the title credits out of sheer vanity because I loved that horse, and uh, they they let me do it, and so they sent a camera down from Yorkshire down to the farm in in um, Surrey where I kept my horse, and that wasn't any good. So we went round the corner. And we went to the farmer and we said, look, there's a lovely field over there. Do you mind if we just go in there with the horse and a camera for 20 minutes and take a shot? Oh, he said, I said, I know you television people. He said, you're made of money. He said, I'd like £2,000, please. So we said, oh, uh, well, we'll think about it. And we watched him go round the corner. We went in and took the shot and drove home. <laughs> Jackie Stoller approached me at the Pindar of Wakefield in the Gray's Inn Road where I was doing a music hall and said would I be interested in uh, meeting her executive producer for the part of Sutton the Butler in Hadley to which I said 
Watts Hadley. I'd never heard of it. I wanted to have a younger feel to it. Mr. Roper, sir. All right, thank you, sir. That's the new man. Yes, I heard from Maxwell a few days ago. He's pretty sick as Scarborough. Poor old Maxwell. Yes, I had a letter myself. Mrs. Maxwell's no better, by all accounts. Well, we were very much a part of Melford. Yes, the old Melford. And I wanted to have somebody coming in that that Hadley could bounce off or not, or have, or, uh, or not. Um, and um, we went for somebody younger and somebody that didn't look like a butler. And also, you weren't quite sure about him. You approve of him, then? Not entirely, no. I don't like the way he creeps about. He what? A good servant should announce his presence discreetly, not creep up on one. The idea of being asked to see about a, a good role in a series was how wonderful. So I did two week two no, two days later, I was taken in to see Peter Wills. Peter Wills was the executive pro producer of Hadley. I was there for about two or three minutes and I was pretty well turfed out. He did not want to know about me. So I came out and went to Jackie's office, Jackie Stoller's office, the producer, and told her, she said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, I'll get Sue, that's Sue Watner, the casting director, and we'll get some scripts for you. Yes, Take them home and read them. Don't tell anybody, will you? And uh, I'll get you to come in and see Peter again, which she did about a week later, and I entered Peter's office as Sutton the butler. I was with him for less than two minutes and he welcomed me to the cast. You always got on with her, didn't you? Oh, yes, we're tremendous chums, but why can't she know about Buxton? Because in all other affairs of this nature, she's turned out to be a mercilessly interfering old... Yes, I see what you mean. Drink? Yes, please. I remember we saw lots of different people, and uh, Peter had done, if my memory serves me right, had done very little at that, at that time. But there was something about him that I just kind of liked, and uh, my directors thought the same thing, and that's why we, we went with him. But it was quite scary, actually, because it was so different from what had gone before. And Jackie Stoller got Peter Dennis, who spent his life riding round for some absurd reason that I've no idea why, on a tandem bicycle. He had about four bicycles. He was bicycle mad. He used to arrive at rehearsal either on a BMX, which I don't think they had in those days, but some sort of modern bike, or on a, a tandem. Gerald treated me as an equal and a good friend. In fact, we used to go to many of the rehearsals on my tandem. Me in front, of course. I'm the chief cyclist. And my boss on the back, and we would cycle to rehearsals on my tandem. And it was kind of fun because when you're on television, you get recognised and you get a lot of fan letters. Well, Rin Tin Tin gets a lot of fan letters and, you know, so you don't want to get too excited. But I remember getting several letters from people saying, I'm not certain, but did I see you on the back of a tandem bicycle? And, and there were people going, hey, look. Uh, as we went past. What's happened to your car? Well, this is exercise, my lady. Well, I certainly didn't think it was pleasure. I normally take it round the back uh, to the, uh, the scullery, but the steps there yes, are rather... Yes, I'm sure they are. The character of Sutton um, was indicated in the scripts, I mean, i.e. he is a butler to a very wealthy family. Uh, there was no indication of what sort of man he was. And uh, my first thing was to go to Ivor Spencer, who um, I met a Fortnum and Mason, so he, he would often go there and advise them on butlering. And in fact, something like 35 years ago, he founded the Ivor Spencer School of Butlering. But throughout the series, I, um, anything that I needed to know that I was uncertain about, I would go straight through to Ivor Spencer and ask his advice. He was so wonderful and so helpful to me. Sutton, what have you done with the whisk? It's not on the nail and it's not in any of the drawers. It is in the drawer, madam, with the silverware. <laughs> Silverware? What on earth did you hide it there for? Hide it? Well, it should be up there with the rest of the kitchen stuff. Well, that's the Sheffield ware, madam. This goes with the foreign. Odd man out, a foreign whisk. It looks wrong. But in fact, Peter did, I think, build up his own um, fan base. I think he got lots, he got a lot of um, people writing to him and saying how wonderful he was. And I do remember about a year after the series finished, this wonderful writer, Ian Curtis. We had great writers, people like David Ambrose, Kerry Harrison. Ian Curtis. I mean, these were wonderful writers. And Ian uh, told me that he had written uh, a particular episode 
which featured Sutton rather more than Hadley. It was not done. You seem to have made a lot of useful contacts in a remarkably short space of time. Have you worked in this sort of household before? What sort of household do you mean, madam? Uh, well, simply country houses, really. I wouldn't say it was altogether unfamiliar. We were very lucky in Hadley. We had a smashing cast. Hilary Dwyer, who was Hadley's wife, certainly in the penultimate series. How did you get in? Mr. Hadley let us in. Who? Hello. There was Jane Marrow, and then there was Hanno, Hannah Gordon. And, and then there was a lady I married and divorced, and that was the great Hilary Dwyer, who I remember meeting up, and I was playing in a golf tournament up in Liverpool, and she comes from up there, or came in, and... Um, and I married, and uh, and I met her, and had dinner with her up in in Liverpool, uh, when I was told that she was going to be the next lady, and uh, and this this was Jackie Stoller, I suppose, who decided that we should get married. I was always against it, but I didn't mind marrying Hilary Dwyer because she was fairly stunning looking. I uh, gather you haven't been formally introduced, uh, James Hadley, old mate from civil service days. Jennifer Caldwell, just an old mate. Hello again. Hello. Well, we cast Hilary because I, as a casting director, I had cast her in a, in a series we did called um, The Challenges. And um, I cast her as a kind of um, fiery, um, rather neurotic um, woman who drank quite a lot. And Peter Wills, who, head of drama, as I've said, um, thought that she would be perfect for it. He thought that she had enough energy and sparkle to to really bounce off Gerald and give him as good as he got, really. And so that's how we ended up with Hilary. Well, I expect you're hungry. I'll uh, get Sutton to make one of his omelettes. He's very good. I accept. What? I accept. No, what do you mean? You accept what? Your proposal. No obstacles anymore. I've been relieved of all my possessions, all the things that I thought were important, and I've just realised that I don't care. I couldn't give a damn. And I got married to Hilary Dwyer. And we had a brilliant director who then went off to America. When it's finally decided he was going to get married, obviously the entire popu female population was waiting to see this fantastic, beautiful wedding you know, with her coming up the aisle looking wonderful and everything. He read the script of our wedding and he decided to put his stamp on it. And instead of having a Hadley wedding, which is what wedding should be, straight, direct, rather moving and rather beautiful, he said, oh, no, we don't want to do that. We'll play against it. Well, Mike, in his wisdom, decided to break all the boundaries and so he had her running up the aisle late in the rain breaking her shoe and coming into the into this church looking completely and utterly dishevelled. So he had it raining, he had Hillary being late, he had the heel of her shoe coming off, he had everything going wrong in a comic way. And while this was happening I thought this isn't quite in the mood of this series. This doesn't seem right to me, but I'm only the actor. When I saw the, ru saw, saw the, the rushes of this, I was shocked, to put it mildly. And I, um, and I said to Gerald, you can't, I said to um, Mike, you can't do this. You're going to have to reshoot it. And he said, I'm not going to reshoot it. And I said, well, you're going to have to, because we can't have this. And then I brought the heavy guns in, at the head of drama, and uh, we did reshoot it. But it was very frightening to stand up to somebody of Michael's stature and say, you've got it wrong. In his terms, of course, he was just cocking at authority and not realising that there was a vast majority of, of, um, of fans wanting a perfectly straightforward wedding. Remembering this was my first producing role, so it was quite hard for me, particularly with, um, with the woman who played his wife, Hilary, Hilary Dwyer, because she was she was very fiery and she could she could let off 
uh, at any moment, and you had no idea where she was going to go with it. Another custom, Sutton, is as follows. To consult me about the menu. Because unless I give you orders to the contrary, I shall be cooking the meal myself when we entertain. Is that understood? Do I take it you wish to cook for 15 people on Saturday, madam? If I wish to cook for 1,500 people, Sutton, I shall do so. I shall cook every night of the week, if I wish, without question from you. And there was one classic day when she was on horseback uh, in the stables at Harney Hall where she yelled expletives at Gerald and just got off her horse and stomped off. And I was so angry with her that I stomped off after her and said, this has got to stop, I, we cannot go on. This is about episode seven. I said, this cannot go on. I said, you know, you've either got to make your peace with Gerald or I will have to write you out of, the, out of some of the episodes while you calm down. And she basically said, do that, and stomped off. And in fact, the head of drama had to come, Peter Wills had to come in and pacify her down. But I did write her out of one episode, so that, um, just so that she could cool off. Oh, well, I suppose Mrs Hadley will be along later, sir. Mrs Hadley will be along, Sutton, as you put it, when she chooses. She's spending a few days with her family. Now, if you have any further domestic problems, perhaps you'd telephone Mrs Hadley and stop bothering me about them. For reasons best left unexplained at the moment, um, she did not wish to do the last series. <laughs> I remember when uh, I was invited to come back for the last series, big surprise, wow, wow, and um, it was uh, Jackie Stoller who rang me, and I said, oh, wow, wonderful, and uh, everybody in it, Gerald and Hamzine and Hillary, not Hillary. Where's she off to, holidays? Uh, not really, no, New York. Some friends of us are opening a gallery. She promised to help out, get it started. Didn't they ask her some time back? I thought she decided not to go. Yes, well, she changed her mind. Oh, why? Well, she just decided uh, not to do it. She's doing something else. But on further inquiry, I found out that she did not wish to be married to Mr. Hadley any longer. The story is she's gone to New York to help a friend open an art gallery, but everyone in the county knows. Well, it didn't last very long, did it? I don't think she would have come back herself. I don't think she was happy doing it. And, and I, didn't think, I didn't quite know where we could go with it myself to be truthful. I didn't know the character had run its, run its course. We haven't spoken, we haven't written, not for two months. That was part of the agreement. Agreement? Neither of us was to feel obliged to get in touch. We just reached a stage where... Well, where we did nothing but quarrel and bicker, and that was on the good days. I think that was something that was taken by all of us, really, um, by by the head of drama and myself and, um, and the writers. Because they, they liked the character, so they could write for it. I mean, that's what happens. Writers fall in love with characters, and then they carry on writing them. Little Jenny Twig, she was just such an adorable little bundle of fun, Jenny Twig. I thought she should be in more. I think she should always be in. I was very fond of her as a human being. Because Gerald and I got on so well, um, I think that that's possibly why I then got to be in the next series. She was my goddaughter and um, I really always felt about her off the screen just like I did on the screen. Cheer. No, it's all right, James, honestly. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear, I'm sorry. She was my favourite goddaughter. She was a lovely, lovely girl to have around, full of gaiety, full of bright. He was a perfect gentleman and he was a good friend and he was kind and I think he did look out for me. Oh, James. It's all right. It's all right. She was quite a forthright, outspoken, tough sort of girl and I used to play those parts when I was in my 20s. Um, I was never the insipid, um, pretty blonde or brunette wittering away in the corner. That was a filthy thing to do. Ah, say, you're wet. Wet? Stop!
stiff and furious. Lisa, would you mind terribly putting on something dry and stop dripping all over my floor? It was quite easy to do because, as I say, I got on so well with Gerald that it was, you know, you just got on and did it, really. I mean, obviously, acting skill is required to hit certain notes at certain times and build a scene and all of that. Um, but, yeah, basically, I've always believed you just get on and do it, really. Don't sit on that chair. It's just been recovered. What on earth are you doing? What's the matter? Scared I'll shock the butler Sutton. <laughs> the butler Sutton? knows <laughs> an exhibitionist when he sees one. That was Mrs Clisby. And who is Mrs Clisby? Oh, don't you know her? No, should I? I think he had to have a love interest, I mean, because that's expected, really. You couldn't have had him as a kind of, you know, just being on his own without, um, without a woman being involved. Mrs Clisby. Good afternoon. Hello. Myra Francis, for my taste, and I, I thought they were all wonderful, but Myra Francis was by far the best. Do you meet early? There's a train at ten. There's a better one at eleven. But I thought Myra Francis had a quality about her. Uh, that was quite extraordinary, and, and we worked together very well. I think that she was, she was a kind of bright, smart businesswoman, um, and, um, and certainly independent. Well, come on, then. Come on where? You know where. Hmm? All right. I think what was nice is she didn't put up with any nonsense. She had a sort of strength of character, which for a sharp man like Hadley was uh, A, enormously appealing, and B, you didn't quite know what was going on in her head. Oh, suddenly, out of the blue, no warning. Should I say sorry? Not yet. I thought of phoning. Couldn't think what to say. I'm here. Sounds silly when you're 200 miles away. Well, I might not have been here. I checked. Do I ask how? No. Simple feminine ploy I might want to use again. Nothing about you is simple. And I, I always feel that if, in fact, we'd gone to a third series, that Myra and that, that, so that character um, and Gerald would have got it together. That's what I would have thought. How long have you been sitting there? Half an hour, sir. I didn't want to wake you. Why not? What is it? <laughs> oh, I was just wondering what I'm going to do if I lose tomorrow. I and others in the series, I don't know what Gerald thought, but when it was David Cunliffe who uh, was the executive producer on the second series, and you know, David was quite good. He had very good um, credentials in the business, but he wasn't Peter Wills, I will say. Uh, but when David outlined the story to us, I, the, the regulars, we were all a little disillusioned. Anyway, the bank's just going to have to carry me for a few months. James, that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Look, I don't know for sure, because I'm not involved anymore. But I'm afraid there could be a difficulty there. Then we'd got rid of the wife, and then I had to have something else to think about. So I thought we were coming into, we were just about coming into a recession then. And I thought, wouldn't it be a good idea to shake Gerald Harper and, uh, well, Hadley, and, um, and so rock the boat so he'll be the same as everybody else. A lot of people thought that was wrong, that I should have left him being up there so everybody could say, oh, isn't he lucky, and isn't it wonderful, we all want to aspire to be Hadley. If you don't get that fella to change his mind in the morning, I'm going to go through the only experience left for the man who has everything, losing it. And one of the reasons that people loved it is because Hadley had everything that they did not have. There he was with this beautiful country home, which was Farnley Hall up in Leeds, which was the home of the uh, Guy de Fawkes family, Guy Fawkes. And he had a yellow Rolls Royce. 
and he had staff, and he had beautiful acres. He wanted for nothing, and we felt it was a great mistake to put him in a situation where he would have to fight for survival. And this. What's this, a High Court writ? When was this served? A few days ago. In person? Oh, just at my front door. Well, why the hell didn't you contact me then? Because I didn't think it was going to be executed. Geoffrey Oswald swore to me it wouldn't be. But unless you reply within a week, they could put the bailiffs in. But I, I personally thought it worked, and, uh, and it brought in lots of different things for, for Hadley to play and to bounce against and to put him under pressure. The ending might have been good for some, but I think for people who really had more of a care for a storyline, a great storyline, and as I say, there were great writers. They could have done so much more with Hadley. He should have continued to succeed. Uh, Wallet, please. Thank you. Sixty-seven pounds. I'll take forty-seven and leave you with twenty, all right? Twenty? Well, you get a receipt. I'll also take the, uh, the bank cards and the driving license. Uh, how did you come here, by the way? By car. Uh, your own car? Yes. Keys, please. I've always thought that there should be a sort of melancholy. There's something about the lonely man on the hill who has everything in the world except what he wants. I don't think he quite knew what he wanted, but that's, that's, a, that's a rather appealing idea, a rather appealing picture. What is your exact address? Melford Park. Mm -hmm. Number? There isn't a number. Oh. Do you own your home? Yes. Mm -hmm. Detached or semi-detached? It's detached. Mm -hmm. With a garden? Yes, there's a sort of garden. Well, they sell much better with gardens. The last scene, which was between Hadley and Sutton, and all has worked out right for him and his bank and his home, etc. And in the script, it was uh, written that H uh, Sutton the butler would pour two glasses of champagne, one for Mr. Hadley and one for Sutton. Sutton! Yes, sir. Just get me a bottle of champagne, would you? And three glasses. Uh, Mrs. Clisby's gone, sir. Three glasses, I said, Sutton. And I had to say to them, no, 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 no. That is not etiquette. There is no way that the boss is going to uh, drink a glass of champagne with his butler. May I say, Congratulations, sir. Oh, you may, Sutton. You may indeed. So we did the last series, and we had a party, and I left, and another actor asked me to give him a lift, and he had an enormous amount to drink. So halfway down the motorway, at four o'clock in the morning, I had to stop in a uh, one of those roadside, you, you know, road garage cafes, and I took him into the gentleman's where he wasn't feeling very well, and I was standing alone in the lavatory of this roadside garage at four o'clock in the morning, and a cleaner came in and asked me for my autograph, and I thought, well, there you are. That's what it's all about. I think, yes, I think we knew there wouldn't be another series. Uh, I, I, I seem to remember that one knew it, knew it was the end when we had that farewell party. I think, it, I think the series had run out of steam. I think it had, we'd done, they'd done, we'd done four in all, and I just don't think there was anywhere else for the character to go. James Hadley today would probably be in a similar situation as he was then, because I think he was clever enough to have sort of hung on to his money um, and it would have managed his property in such a way that it wouldn't have been completely decimated by taxes and so on. He'd probably be down in Dorset doing what he did then. You know, he'd still be doing that. There are people who do still do that nowadays. I would think running up, up, until, up to six months ago, probably running a merchant bank. Well, he'd be retired, of course, wouldn't he? 
yes he'd be retired doing more or less um, living living off living off the fat of the land and probably fishing and playing golf and traveling he'd be saying I will not get into a bath chair and I will still ride a horse which is why I celebrated my 75th birthday by riding a horse across Africa the trouble was after five days I was in the middle of the Mara River and I was attacked by a lion.